want to congratulate Lori for a really tremendous program, and uh, I'm delighted that the future of energy is on the agenda. Consider that every two weeks between India and China, a new coal-powered power plant is coming online. No wonder Bill Gates recently said that he would be more gratified by a breakthrough in energy than by finding a cure to a terrible disease. To guide us through this vital set of issues, uh, we have with us this afternoon uh, Doug Fouché, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of El Paso Corporation, and uh, our moderator, Jason Grimet, Founder and President of the Bipartisan Policy Center, which develops and promotes bipartisan solutions to the country's most difficult public policy challenges. Doug, Jason, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. It's uh, very nice to be here. And to the people over my right shoulder and Doug's left shoulder, um, this is the only eye contact that you're going to uh, receive in the next 30 minutes. Um, it, it's a real pleasure to be here and to be talking with Doug. Uh, down a little bit. Um, Doug isn't just a remarkable moment. He uh, took over a company 80 years ago and really transformed it into one of the most effective and innovative energy companies in the country. And he is in the middle of what I think is the most important and most interesting energy issue to come across the uh, fancy about the, the generation. And that is the incredible boom in natural gas. From my standpoint, we have actually had an energy policy for the last 30 years that was predicated upon an ample and cheap supply of natural gas. And it's actually incredibly uh, lucky that it showed up in time. But just to uh, start in the broadest sense, um, why do you think that this is important for energy policy in the country? What, what is it about this new natural gas resource that really is going to make a difference? So a couple of things. One is just to, just to sort of uh, get everyone at the same base level. Of course, everybody knows how much energy we use in the U.S. every year, right? So anybody that knows the answer, just go ahead and raise your hand. 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy is what we use in a year. So I'll tell you a brief sidebar story. I had my son's uh, third grade class in, this was many years back, and I was trying to explain to them, you know, this is what my dad does for a living. And I was trying to explain the concept of liquefied natural gas. And I said, you know, you take a gas and you have to make it really cold and, and make it turn into a liquid. How cold do you think it has to be? And this hand goes up in the back of the room and this kid sort of says, bashfully, um, minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit. The actual answer is minus 256 degrees Fahrenheit. And I said, this is third grade. So I don't want to say you're the remedial crowd. <laughs> um, anyway, I said, well, how did you guess that number? He said, well, I knew that minus 260 was the number for nitrogen, and I thought natural gas might be close. <laughs> Both of his parents worked for Shell in the research lab. Uh, so 100 quadrillion BTUs. And if you said, where does that come from today? It's about... Uh, 37, 38 percent oil. It's about 24 percent natural gas. It's about 23 percent coal. It's about seven and a half percent renewables, and it's about eight percent nuclear. So, and, and if you think about where that gets used, you know where it gets used, right? Transportation. So, 90 percent of transportation fuels come from oil, and then you have industrial, residential, and commercial. That's more a, a bit more of a mixed mixed bag, and then you have electricity. That's, by the way, the load that's growing. Electricity is 50% coal plus minus, 20% gas, and then every, the everything else category. So if you, if you look at that up at the high level, 85% of that 100 quadrillion BTUs today is fossil fuels. 7.5% of that, roughly, these are 2008 numbers, kind of the most recent data available, 7.5% of that is renewable. So 2%. Hydro, 2% that environmentally friendly wood, 1.5% um, wind, one tenth of 1% one solar. So when you begin to talk about the answer to the future for energy in the US, I think you have to be somewhat realistic about where we are and about the amount of investment that will be required for us to move into that energy future. So we're on this inexorable move from uh, low technology, high carbon content, 
to higher technology, lower carbon content, to ultimately someday no carbon content. But that's a very long track. So in my business, the natural gas business, for most of the last 60, 70 years, we've been in the business of just a, a basic, basic kind of geology. Uh, hydrocarbons get formed way down in the earth and, and, and areas that we call the kitchen. And then in the geologic time, when those hydrocarbons have been formed, they migrate up through natural fissures in the rock until they come to something that stops their movement, right? And then they're trapped. So for most of the last 50, 60 years, we've used various technologies, seismic technology to image where these coffee cups were, where these glasses were. And we drill down, and hopefully we you know, drill in the top. Uh, if we did, then we produce the hydrocarbon. Sometimes we drill off to the side. That's called a dry hole. <laughs> Here's what's different about, and this is why this, this, what's happened with shales is so such a game breaker for our industry, but also a game breaker for the country. The shale, you hear about the shale gas revolution, the Marcella shale and others, it's because that's the kitchen, okay? The kitchen where we knew hydrocarbons were because that's where they were cooked in geologic time. But it's a shale. If I were to show it to you, it would look like a piece of a chalkboard. So how in the hell do you produce any hydrocarbon out of that? That's what's been answered in the last 10 years. Both from uh, the stamp, both in terms of drilling technology and completion technology. That's really important because guess what? The shales are not glasses. The shales are blankets. So now, uh, it's not that they're com completely homogenous, but they're very similar across broad swaths. Two big technologies changed the, the world for us. One, horizontal drilling. We used to drill down into the cup. That was it. On a good day, we might start over here and drill into the cup. Now we drill down 14,000 feet, and we drill out as far as 8,000 feet. So when we hit the blanket, instead of just intersecting at one point, we get inside that thick blanket, and we go 8,000 feet that way. Okay, so that well bore is exposed to more of the area that has the potential to produce hydrocarbon. Then we fracture stimulate. What does that mean? We pump a lot of pressure into that well bore. Sometimes as much as 12 or 13,000 pounds per square inch. You put about 32 pounds in your car tire until we fracture the rock. And when that rock fractures, it, allows, it, it in effect creates a pathway for that natural gas to get to the well bore. Those two technologies have changed our industry and, and in effect changed the world. And now, natural gas industry, at least the part that we're in, is much more like a manufacturing business. We go about our business in a different way now. We get large acreage positions and then we manufacture well bores. Um, why is that important? Well, because uh, 20 years ago we talked about kind of every year we had 10 more years of natural gas. Today that number is 100 years. Um, the recent estimates suggest that we have more natural gas reserves in the U.S. than Saudi Arabia has oil reserves. Natural gas is a fossil fuel, no doubt, but it's the cleanest fossil fuel. So it has the potential in a, in a, in a pathway toward a carbon-free world for a very long period of time to offer a low-cost, relatively cleaner form of energy that's domestic and oh, by the way, um, because it's domestic, all that activity happens with U.S. jobs. So today, direct and indirect, something like 2.9 million dollars, 2.9 2 million jobs, like 3% of the U.S. workforce is in some way either directly or indirectly involved in the natural gas value chain. And it's red states and blue states. States so which the, one state? So the, you know, the economic potential yeah. profound. I want to get into infrastructure, which is, I know, really where your uh, heart and soul is. But there's been, as you, of course, you and probably most people know, a lot of controversy around hydrofracturing. And I think a lot of confusion about hydrofracturing. Right. Um, what can you say about those issues and what the industry can be doing better to kind of address those public concerns? So the, the issue is this. As anytime you drill a well, 
if, it, if the well goes 14,000 feet deep, it goes through the water, right? And water tables are typically in the first few hundred to several hundred feet. So one thing we know is that when, when that well bore goes through the water table down and, and it's at 14,000 feet and you fracture stimulate, there isn't a way that that fracture stimulation goes 14,000 feet up into a fresh water arm. How do we know that? We, because now, technology, we put micro seismic arrays out, and when we fracture stimulate that well at 14,000 feet, we can watch in real time the fractures grow. They go two or 300 feet, two or 300 feet. So in my view, at the end of the day, that is not a risk. And in fact, I think the industry has done a pretty good job of managing it. So the question becomes, what do you put in that frack? That's one, one issue. Uh, it's sand, water, 99.5% water, and a half percent chemicals that are used to, in effect, uh, lubricate the hydrocarbons to get them back to the bowl. That's the part, that's the bit that causes great concern and it's justifiable. And now the industry has uh, forums where most of the major producers now in the U.S. go and report what's in them. And then the second thing you have to worry about is where that, that pipe still exists through the water table, does it seal that around? Especially if you all drilled a good well. Right. We drilled and fracture stimulated over a million wells in the U.S. Uh, and so, at, at least in my view, um, there's always more that we can do in the industry working on things like now, like for example, uh, we just did the first fracture stimulation well using a suite of products that are all made from food products. Um, I think that's, I mean, this is obviously a huge opportunity for the industry. It's not lost on the industry what public concerns are, and I think we, we will learn together and I think come up with the right answer for both the industry and to protect the public. Well, last question on the production side. You said two things that are, well, a lot of things that are important, but two things that stick together. One is it's red states and blue states, and it's basically manufacturing. So one of the best things about the shale gas is that it's almost everywhere. And one of the worst things about the shale gas from a public engagement reality is that it's almost everywhere. The communities that have really had almost no experience for 100 years working in the energy industry are now engaged, and that it's heavy manufacturing. So how much of the issue do you think is just the reality of an industrial footprint in places that haven't experienced it, and what do you think could be done if anything's necessary to address that? Um, I think there, that's a big part of the issue, right? You're going into areas that haven't experienced um, any kind of oil and gas production or haven't for, for many, many years, and all of a sudden there is a therapy boom driven by the economics associated with that, and that has positives and negatives. There are no there are no zero impact energy sources. And I think the, the, the thing that ultimately will happen in my view is rational people will come up with rational solutions. Um, and but, but I think in, in the real world where all of us live, that those hundred quadrillion BTUs of energy that we consume every year, and those numbers, by the way, they don't change dramatically overnight. And in some cases, they don't change dramatically in the decade. The infrastructure necessary to do all this is tremendous. And I think it behooves everyone to have a seat at the table, but also to come up with uh, a reasonable solution that, that takes advantage of the opportunity that's provided and also protects the public's health. And I have uh, great confidence in that. So you just said the word infrastructure. I'm sure you also all know that this gentleman uh, was a company that's 43,000 miles of natural gas pipeline, which is woefully inadequate for the challenge of actually in an economically effective way bringing all this gas to market. What do you see as the opportunities and the method by which we're going to expand infrastructure? And I guess the second question is, are there barriers, either economic or regulatory, that are going to make that difficult? Uh, yeah, we touch every day about 27, 28 percent of the natural gas that moves around the U.S. So uh, our pipeline operations literally go from Bakersfield, California, to to Boston, and and it's a 24/7, 365 job. Uh, uh, you don't want to hear on the coldest day of winter that we were unable to deliver your natural gas. That each 
Mr. Homer provides the pilot light on your stove. And that is, uh, we take that responsibility very seriously. Uh, the, the latest estimates suggest that there's somewhere, between, somewhere in excess of $100 billion of incremental infrastructure to be built to support not just growth and demand for natural gas, but the changes in flows. I can't overemphasize to you that what, that what has happened in the last decade with regard to natural gas is unlike anything I've ever seen in my 30 years of this industry. And we have examples of a, we have an example of a brand new pipeline that was built to move Rocky Mountain natural gas to the East Coast. Now there are serious discussions, and by the way, it was only completed um, two years ago, 18 months ago. There are already serious discussions about reversing the flow of that pipeline back to go from east to west because of the impact of the Marcellus shale and the uh, Utica shale, which is sort of the next shale to come. These are big, big, huge uh, issues. And I live, we live in the world of building big infrastructure. So I, I can give you one example. We just completed a pipeline that goes from the western edge of the Rocky Mountains to the California Oregon border called the Ruby Pipeline. A uh, $3.7 billion pipeline, 42 inch steel pipe, went 680 miles. The gestation period for that project, which if we manage the project well, will still be transporting natural gas over 100 years from now. The gestation period for that project was four and a half to five years. The actual construction period, less than a year. We have five, we have 5,000 employees. We hired 5,000 people to work on the Ruby Pipeline. So it's, they're, they're, they're real jobs. They're among the highest paying uh, blue collar jobs in America. And, but, but I, if I could just explain to you what it's like to try to build something like that. Uh, we had uh, 1,000 water body crossings in 680 miles. Each one of those water body crossings has, has its own set of environmental regulations about when we can be in that stream bed and when we can't. Uh, we, we dealt with migratory pathways for all kinds of animals. We had uh, sage grouse nests, sage grouse nesting areas, raptor nests, uh, lawn trout. These are, these are big national issues. We had over 200 archaeologists on our payroll. So they, they go out ahead of every mile on federal lands and inspect it for items of historical significance. I'll give you one example of, of this an actual occurrence. The, the archaeologists are working and they say, we found a tooth. Now, um, the cost of construction of this project at its peak was five to ten million dollars a week. So that, that it's, it's expensive. So we could be a human tooth, so we fly in a paleontologist. The paleontologist reviews it. Yes, it's a human tooth. It dates from this period of time. During that period of time, this particular tribe had dominion over the land. They have a religious ceremony to, to perform over that tooth. But there's a separate uh, Native American tribe that disputes their sovereignty, and they have a different religious ceremony. At the end of this, at the end of all of this, we are required to reinter the tooth where it came from. So now we're, we are going to live within the rules that are laid out for us. But to put it in context, if you added up all those, my guess is of the $3.7 billion project, six or seven hundred million of the 3.7 were issues similar to that. And so you will pay for that. That will be a component of the cost of gas for the next hundred years. I'm not saying, I'm not here to debate whether it's right or wrong. I'm here to ask the question whether anybody's asking the question. I always wondered how archaeologists got jobs out of grad school. <laughs> we would have hired, we had a shortage actually of archaeologists. We would have hired anyone that even your brother in law yeah. <laughs> So, warning, I'm going to ask uh, one more question and uh, see if you all have any uh, you'd like to ask. A lot of focus on shale gas, but also uh, incredible new possibilities with shale oil, which of course is different than oil shale. And yes. if you could just explain that a little bit, what do you see as the, the prospects there to have an increase in domestic oil production, which actually we have been increasing domestic oil production to make people surprised for the last several years. 
We do. Uh, and in fact, the National Drug Council just put out a report, and one of the big surprises in the report was not just that there's a significant increase in the gas resource, but also in the oil resource. It's the same technology. It's, it's taking shale, uh, which instead of cooking gas, cooks oil, um, and drilling into that shale, drilling horizontally, fraction stimulating it so that the oil can migrate to the surface and then, and then producing the oil. And it's, it is it's already significant. I believe it's going to be more significant. That's not the primary part of our business. We do two things. We're an interstate natural gas transportation company, and we have an exploration and production company that's uh, more dominantly gas uh, today. Anybody want to uh, ask a question? Okay. Really, we're not going to the, uh, I'll, I'll repeat it, but you can tell us who you are. Then. I'm James Jason from Alabama. And um, I'd like to know something about the economy of gas. First of all, we can't hear you. We'll repeat the question. Uh, if, if, if gas is, 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 is $4 uh, per million BTU, that's what per right. Fuels. 
with and taking into account all of the implications? Because I, I don't think people know there is no silver bullet. There is no energy source available in the world today which doesn't have a consequence to it. The, the issue is which consequences do you want? And uh, if we can ever get to that that dialogue with rational people, then, then maybe for the first time in my life we could have a national energy policy. I'm from uh, central Illinois, and we have a large shale uh, deposits in the southern and east central part of Illinois. I didn't know if you know of any companies that are going to be coming into that area to look at that, and if they are, uh, I have a 300 acre farm there, and I'd like to talk to you later. Talk to me after the beach, no. uh, 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 I'm sure, I, I can just tell you that, um, that people who make their living looking for the next great hydrocarbon find, Mostly geologists and geophysicists are scouring the globe looking for opportunities for shale, not just in the U.S., but everywhere else in the world. Which is, which is why, I mean, it, another reason that this has such tremendous implications is because it's not just that, that this resource is um, available and domestic. It's, it's big, and it's down at the lower end of the cost curve. So things start to happen like Dow Chemical, which for the last 15 years has said they would never build another facility in the United States, is now planning dramatic expansions to their chemical facilities in the U.S. That's U.S. jobs. When you build a chemical plant, you can't, you can't once you build it, it's a 50-year deal, right? Or maybe a 100-year deal. And this, uh, being the World Affairs Council, we should note that countries like Poland have a lot of shale gas. And you can't imagine how excited they are maybe not new lines on Russian gas for all the reasons you say. Uh, by the way, can I say one thing? thing? You asked me about oil, about, yeah. uh, about oil, and I know there's a, a controversy around a pipeline. We're not part of the great Canadian oil down in the U.S. I, I hope some, somewhere along, along the line somebody asked a comparative question. The comparative question, which is, if you don't build a pipeline, where does the incremental barrel come from? It's not as if you don't have an incremental barrel barrel comes on a ship. And if you just look over the last hundred years, which way you'd rather transport crude oil? If you're going to use it in a pipeline or in a ship, you would come to the conclusion that you want to do it in a pipeline. Okay, there's two more questions. Thank you very much for your enlightened uh, presentation. Um, I think about a month ago I saw an ads on a report that Kinder was putting it on the table of merger contract, if you will. Yes. Is that been finalized and approved? And if so, is that uh, signal a kickoff, perhaps, in merger activity in the, in the natural gas business in the United States? Um, for those of you who don't know, we did announce recently that uh, El Paso uh, has entered into a merger agreement with Morgan Inco, create the fourth largest energy company in, in North America, something that we're very excited about. Um, scheduled to close uh, sometime in the second quarter of 2012, um, at which time I'll be looking for a job if they don't have any openings I can use my resume. Uh, um, beyond that, because because that part is pending, I really couldn't say anything else. We can do these two more quick questions. Okay. Is this all good news or, or are there is there a downside? Are, are there risks that, that you're Concern you that you need to deal with it? Or is yeah. it all just thumbs up? No. No, I think that's if you left here with the impression that I'm trying to tell you there is no consequence to natural gas development, then you then, then I've just spoken. But the impression I want to leave you with is there is there is not no consequence to any energy solution. But if I were to pick among the slate, so think about this today. You cannot build a nuclear power plant in the US. For all practical purposes, you cannot build a new coal-fired power plant in the U.S. Wind is roughly one and a half percent of our energy demand. Solar is one tenth of one percent. So, if we could all assume that at some point we have a rather robust economy, the implication of that is more demand for energy in some form and more demand for uh, electric power in particular because each of you have what we call 
uh, rabbit devices and vampire device devices. The vampire devices are, tonight when you go home, do a little experiment for me. After you've turned out the last light in your house, walk around and see all the things that glow behind the door. <laughs> okay? The rabbit devices are the, is the one device that you used to have that's now a, an iPad and a cell phone and a, you know, and other things. Um, if, if we're going to acknowledge the reality of that world, then what natural gas offers is a scalable, relatively clean, low carbon fossil fuel alternative at a low cost, which is domestic and will create tremendous jobs at a time when we could all agree that's an important thing, not without consequence. And so what do I worry about? I worry about, I worry about, frankly, whether all of my employees that are on those rigs are safe every day. Um, I worry about water quality. That's water quality and air quality are the two big things that, that, that we have to deal with with natural gas. Just like we have to deal with with coal. The average coal plant uses 30,000 acre feet a year of water. Uh, question? Yeah, I'm Mark Meidel from the California Central Coast near, near Los Angeles. <laughs> Is there a difference between the nuclear vulnerability of hydroelectric uh, uh, gas fired? And, and let's say coal-fired plants, and if so, sorry, is there a difference in what well, risk? The, 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 the risk of destruction in a nuclear attack. Um, I'm not an expert on that. I have to say, um, but I would say this: uh, the, the more distributed your energy source is. I would say the less likely it is to be dramatically impacted by a single point attack. So, uh, you know, uh, a million gas wells versus, you know, a few nuclear power plants, I would say, though I'm not an expert on it, it would strike me as a Let us thank Doug very much. And